Every speaker, in some capacity or other, talks about talks about um, disruption, talks about jobs going away, talks about the future being uncertain and so on. What is your message to the young people? What are they supposed to do with this uncertain future? Do, they, do we still give them some, something to study? Will the thing they study still actually exist in the future? John, what are your thoughts on that? John Kilmer. <laughs> Easy that's question. A, that's, a, that's a very big question. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and look, and, and, and I'm not, I, I, I'm, I'm not the best person to ask to answer it. But what I do is I, 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 I read a lot of what other people are thinking, and I think one of the most impressive things that I've, I've seen recently it was actually a year ago. Uh, Jack Ma gave a very, very good presentation at the World Economic Forum, and he spoke about the fact that you know the way we learn right now in school, right back to school days. Is, is around um, building up knowledge. But why are you building up knowledge when you can go to Google to find that? You, you don't need to, to learn stuff and memorize stuff anymore. You, you, what you need to be able to do is to read it and understand it. And where he went with it was that um, the more creative skills are what we need to be building. The, you know, we need to be putting a higher emphasis on fine art, um, you know, um, authors and, and, and painting and, and, and those type of creative where linking it with technology and linking it with the knowledge that you can gain from technology. But, but that's going to be the difference. So the difference between a robot and a human being is the human being can get tangents. So we need to start thinking about how do we access th those parts of our brain that will bring in stuff from a tangent. Uh, if it's just a straight line and if it's just, you know, doing, doing a process, a robot can do that. The, mm. the difference for us will always be uh, bringing stuff from a tangent. I mean, we think about creativity and creating a space that, that, that you can get great ideas. You get great ideas mostly, you know, I, I, I coded for a good number of years. The best ideas that I got were in the shower in the morning. You could stay, stay, stay there watching the code for two hours, wouldn't make one bit of difference. Get up, walk away, go out, have a cup of coffee, get an ice cream, come back in, and there you have it, there's my So problem. how do we translate that into what we do and say with our young kids? How do we translate that into our education system? Just a very easy question, John. I, I, I think it is, about, um, it is about building in that creativity. Right. Forget about rote learning. Show people how to access information and get them to use that information to come up with solutions. Build in the creativity of, you know, blank page draw something, you know, go from that, that position that it's, that it's not about rote learning anymore. Um, and it's create, you know, more interesting spaces and, and, and allow for failure. Um, you know, there is no right or wrong answer when you talk about drawing a picture. One person's picture is as good as another's. Um, so, 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 okay, so if I understand you correctly, Focus on the creativity, on the artistic side, which, which, which we believe, at least now, AI is something it cannot, cannot duplicate. You've been with us in, in Bahrain for a number of years, and we're very happy to have someone of your stature work in the EDB and help promote Bahrain and so on. In your assessment, how are we doing on this front? How well are we preparing the youth of, of today for tomorrow's uncertain future? <laughs> Um, I, I, I'll be, I, I'm always honest, uh, and that's what gets me into most of my trouble. Um, the, 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 the fact is that we're mixed. Okay. Um, you know, our education system, it, we've a kind of a two-pronged two education system. We have uh, about 80, well, close to 90 private schools at, at the primary, you know, and secondary stage some of the best schools that you're going to come across. We have about 220 public schools that I would say can do better. 
uh, we have again mixed private and public um, uh, uh, third level schools. Uh, some are doing quite well, others are struggling. Um, I, I do think that one of the issues we have when we get to graduate level is experience. Um, so we have some, some graduates that come out with really, really good, ex, uh, good degrees, um, but they generally don't have experience. I think one of the things that we could build into our educational system at third level is the idea of internships. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's a particular problem for Bahrain because if I come out of, out of the university or the polytechnic or any of the other universities here, um, I'm not just competing against other graduates for positions, I'm competing against uh, an experienced expat community mm -hmm. at, at higher numbers than maybe in other economies where 50% of the economy is made up of expats. So I coming in as a, as a graduate, I don't have, I have the training, I have the knowledge, I, I sh I, but I don't have experience. Um, and we, we have to help graduates in that space. We have to ensure that they have the opportunity to build up that experience. Um, and, and you know, there are examples of where that works quite well. The, the Polytechnic does that quite yeah. well and, and the employability of their graduates are, are, are very good. We need to extend that uh, right throughout because otherwise graduates, they, they're, they're at a disadvantage from day one. Fantastic, thank you. Dr. Tharoor, you, you and I, in the previous discussion, we spoke about the youth and we spoke about education. We spoke about parents' expectations, okay? We have young kids here, high school students, university students. We talked about the parents' perspective, but from a student's perspective who's now, he or she is learning that there's this disruption thing happening. I don't even know if, if, if you can get a job. You know, our, maybe not my generation, but a previous generation, the idea of jobs for life was very much alive. What do we tell them? What should we do with them? Well, it's, before I tell them, I want to tell the teachers, and I've been doing that every opportunity I get at a school or con college convocation. I tell teachers, don't teach children what to think. Teach them how to think. Right. A lot of the Indian educational system, again, building on the colonial education system, just crams kids in India full of facts and figures and uh, textbook materials and classroom lectures which are then expected to regurgitate in the examinations. And I keep saying to them exactly what our previous speaker just said, you don't need all that in the era of Google. Yes. You know, two clicks of the mouse will find out anything you need to in the real world. What you really need is not a well-filled mind, but a well-formed mind. Mm. A well-formed mind is one that deals with completely unfamiliar information, but knows how to absorb it, knows how to get, discern the necessary patterns in it, and knows how to then apply it to new situations. Now, the point is precisely because of this bewildering speed of change that I talked about in my speech, that um, you can't prepare kids through your schoolwork and examinations for the jobs that they might be competing for 10 years from now because those jobs may not exist today. Right. So they've just got to have the kinds of minds and the basic skill sets to be enabling them to adapt to whatever the requirements of the new job are, plus, of course, to have the aptitude to be retrained because obviously a certain amount of Retraining is going to be required when new professions come around. I mean, when the horse buggy drivers suddenly had to become automobile drivers, they Correct. had to be retrained. Correct. But the fact is that they knew the basic principles of how to steer a vehicle and handle a road. They just had to learn the technology that made it possible to do that. If they didn't know that either, they could start from scratch, but it's tougher. So what you need is kids who um, realize that, you know, that really the mark of, I think Einstein said something like this, the mark of an educated mind <laughs> is what's left behind in your head when you've forgotten everything you studied for the examinations. Uh -huh. So the examinations are there, they show you the mastery of what you learned yesterday, but what's left behind in your mind is what will help you deal with the problems of tomorrow. So we have 50 seconds left. You have two PhDs. Well, Why? I have one what? I earned the hard way and I have half a dozen I got picked up for. So, so, really. so, but one I earned the hard way. One you earned the hard way. Why and how? A PhD? Well, it's a very good question because I told my kids, don't bother. Right. I enjoyed it. It taught me two things. One was, of course, how to go in great depth into a small subject. In my case, I chose a fairly broad subject. Uh, collect an awful lot of material, synthesize it, and come up with conclusions. 
And in those days, it was much harder than it is for today's kids, because today's kids have the, uh, the computers, the laptops, the internet, right. the ability to load a million pages on their hard drive. You actually had to go to the library. I had to go to many libraries. I had to write things down on slips of paper and index cards, collate them, reorganize them, and, and discern patterns in them. So it was, a, it was a rigorous discipline. That was worthwhile. But the actual acquisition of a PhD that had helped me later in life, is there anything I did that was enhanced by the fact that I was a PhD and not merely a master's degree holder or whatever? Frankly, I doubt it. I mean, the thing is that um, education is very important and useful when it teaches you things you're not learning in real life. Right. Uh, so the one good thing I learned was this mastery of vast amounts of material. In everything else, you know, I, mean, I can tell you, my kid, for example, um, uh, went off as an intern after Yale University to Time magazine. They liked his work so much, that within weeks, they offered him a regular job. Okay. Now, a year later, he had planned to be an intern for a year and go into Columbia School of Journalism to be a journalist. He got in. So he wrote to me saying, you know, he called me in those days, I guess, email or Skype or whatever, saying, I got into Columbia. And I said, you're crazy. <laughs> People go to Columbia to get the job exactly. you've already got. It's a means to an end. You got the end. Why, got why the get end. into Columbia? Yes. So, you know, he, I was this guy with five degrees, you know, the four that I'd earned and, and others that I'd been awarded. And he assumed that I'd be in favor of his getting another degree, and I told him, don't bother. And I don't regret it. He's had a stellar career since, and he's now with the Washington Post. And, and he's built his reputation by doing right. rather than by learning. And, and ultimately, learning can come from doing. So do. The, 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 um, a friend of mine who uh, worked in the banking industry for many, many years told me this story. This happened around the financial crisis of about a decade ago. So there's, he had an employee with him, very, very capable, doing really, really well. And he said, I, wanted, I want to leave to get a, a master's degree. So my friend said, well, you've got a job. And you, we need you. You're doing well. Why get a master's degree? No, no, no. It's my job to get a master's degree. I'm going to go to the UK and get a master's degree. So lo and behold, he leaves his job. He goes to the UK to get a master's degree. The financial crisis comes back, happens. He comes back, and he has no job. But he has a master's degree. So, you know, it's, and you, people confuse, you know, they put the horse in front of the cart. You know, you've, the master's degree is supposed to be a means to an end in most cases. Then if you have the end, then there's no need for the, for the degree. Absolutely. I want to change to John, John uh, Sinai. So I mentioned earlier in my talk, I had the privilege of visiting your beautiful country. And we met with some, some remarkable people. And, and I'm an admirer, at least of the early stage of, of, of what the ANC could do and, and the transition and so on. Why does South Africa continue to have an education problem? The, 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 um, depending on which index you look at, it's, it's generally considered a really, really poor education system. Why is it? Does it concern you? And how does one fix that? Easy question. Yeah, quick, quick. I'll give you just a quick answer to that. Um, I think what happened with South Africa, unfortunately, there was firstly a level of emotional entitlement from the people that were suppressed before. And the level of entitlement didn't create any hunger for growth, but thought they deserved it just because they were there. So that was the first thing. And culturally, that's starting to be weeded out. The second thing is we had a leader for eight years that was a greedy little boy that <laughs> created absolute havoc in the country with the Gupta family and right. they totally um, flushed us of a lot of money and so the focus went off uh, education or anything actually for that matter. We are very lucky to have an incredible president now, Soro Ramaphosa, who is a billionaire in his own right and really is not there to make money. In fact, he's donated half his salary to charity and he's brought in all the old school ministers back in again and everything now is starting to take a futuristic stance rather than a how much money can we fit into our pocket stance so i think as any country is in a process of maturing and if you think about south africa as 20 odd years old we were teenagers just recently and boy did we act like teenagers and uh, now that that's gone past i think there's a cultural nuance of forgiveness that's required and again that's starting to bubble up so I think besides education, I think South Africa is young and we are expecting uh, to be compared to Australia's and England's of the world, which I think is incredibly unfair. And as a young nation, I think only now are we starting to find our feet with the leadership that we have. And I'm really excited as a South African for the next eight years to see what Cyril Ramaphosa is going to do. 
plus. I think with the advent of almost two thirds of South Africans now being connected to the internet, and we have another third to go, which will happen real soon, our access to internet and information is increasing our opportunity to learn and grow. And so of the 50 odd million people that live in South Africa, only about 10 to 12 million live great lives. The rest of the country is in poverty. And so those people to be empowered with information, which is now starting to happen, I think we have a very bright future. So in, in 42 seconds, what is, so your talk was, was, was very, very insightful. To what degree is this happening in South Africa? And to what degree is that being adopted by the, either the entrepreneurial ecosystem, the education system, and so how do you think, see things developing there? Well, I, I, did a, I did a talk a little while back at an African tech conference, and I, sp I opened the conference and I called my talk, We Are Not African. We are, not we are not African. Right. And what's the, the, the unfortunate stat is that only 0.5% of the global VC funding is spent in the whole of Africa. In fact, Atlanta, as one city in America, has more VC funding than the whole of Africa. Oh, wow. So we suffer from Africanism. And by that, I mean we see ourselves as less than the rest of the world. Right. And it's a consciousness that we have to overcome. And we, it's going to take time. And uh, I think that's what we're suffering mostly. And once we get rid of that consciousness and we become braver and more courageous with the world around us, I think we can step up to the plate. So again, I'm optimistic about where we're going. I do think we have a long way to go because culturally we need to become global and we're not there yet. Great. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Samer, you're, you, again, you're a PhD holder. I believe you went to Stanford, if I'm not mistaken. Princeton, I'm sorry, Princeton. And, and as someone who's an academic and a, a creative entrepreneur, which is a, a, rare, a rare, I think, uh, mix to have, education system in Bahrain, what are your thoughts and what is your message to the youth, the youth of Bahrain? I think the education system in Bahrain is uh, transitioning towards what, where it needs to be. Um, if you look at the future, you, you've always got to uh, be in sync with what type of skills and what kind of technologies are, appear to be prevalent in the future. So we definitely see the advent of artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, the, fourth, the whole fourth industrial revolution and its related technologies. So if you look at certain countries, I had the privilege of visiting a number of states in the United States when we were looking for manufacturing sites. And I was impressed with the way that a lot of them approach education. They were actually looking at it very proactively. And in one particular state, they started educating elementary school students in STEM education. Mm -hmm. So they were already starting to learn engineering. So for, at the for age those of, that don't know what STEM is, can you just explain it? It's about science and technology, um, engineering, uh, and, engineering math. Uh, math. and math. So it's, uh, these are the skills that are seen to be needed in the next 20 years. And so what they would, would do is that they would actually take the elementary school kids and at the age of four and five, they have them assemble, you know, starting from Lego robots uh, moving on to mechanical, remote-controlled uh, machines. They start coding from basically around the same time that they learn writing. And, and so they actually grow up to be conversant with these technologies. And they tell you, I mean, what research says is that, you know, the, the optimum prime age for education it's not when you're 20 or 18. It's actually it's the ages from between, let's say, 5 to 10. Right. And if you can grow the right level of or the right direction at that early stage, you will create the right uh, transformation for the future. But in order to do this, where, where we come to an issue in Bahrain, is that you need teachers who are adapted to this, who, who mm. know this process. And so here, it's not really a lack of will, it's perhaps a lack of assets in terms of educational resources, people who have those skills, even in private schools. So I have two daughters who, who went to private schools in Bahrain, some of the best ones, but even then I'm not really that impressed by the level of the teachers themselves uh, when compared to what I've seen elsewhere in the US. So I think we have a lot to move towards providing the right kind of teachers, like my colleague said, uh, uh, 
you've got to have uh, they've got to have a vision, and it's not about memorization or about doing well in exams. It's it's how do you create that fertile uh, ground for people to learn. Perfect. Thank you so much. And I, and I agree with, with what Dr. Uh, Tharoor just said and, and what you said. I mean, it's all good to talk about the students, but what about the teachers that teach the students, right? And I think that's where a lot of energy needs to go to. And, and there was a time where a teacher's job was the most prestigious job you could have. It was really a very, very respectable job. It still is, but it doesn't have as much status as it used to have in, in society. And I don't know when we lost this, but really before, a teacher was something that was very, very important. I think we need to go back to that. We need to bring, we bring the teacher to the forefront and say, your job is the most important job in the country because you're educating the future. Our hands are not in the kids. Our future is not in the hands of the kids. It's in the hands of the teachers. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Um, Sikiyama-san, um, in Japan, from outside looking into Japan, you know, we think that the Japanese education system is probably one of the best in the world. Really? But yeah, we, that's what we think. But yeah, and I'm glad you reacted that, that way. So my question to you, sir, is the education system in Japan, is it preparing the next generation for the future? Is it preparing the next generation of the next Sekiyama-sans to come up and to build biotech companies? Or is it lacking something? Yeah, this is a difficult question. Um, I think uh, the mm, Japanese education sh system is uh, really um, not so uh, traditional. Okay. Uh, uh, no, no, no. Traditional. It's traditional. Yeah, traditional. Too traditional. Yeah. But um, fortunately, uh, my lab in K University, that is very um, cutting edge. Uh, thinking and my professor, uh, grand uh, teacher, uh, he is uh, he has uh, three PhDs. Wow! And one is computer science and engineering and molecular biology. Sure. And he made our um, the biotech lab uh, institute uh, in two thousand one, and uh, his lab is really uh, interdisciplinary. Culture. And um, so, but um, the many of the Japanese university or labs uh, are not like that. Really? Yeah. So, um, but um, the my lab or the few uh, the very good uh, leaders. Uh, is uh, doing um, change, uh, ma making change uh, of uh, Japanese education system. Okay. So, yeah, m my view is really optimistic. Good. Uh, but um, I think uh, the my uh, lab was a really uh, rare case. Mm, I think. So you're the exception rather than the rule in yeah. the education. What about in the primary schools and the secondary schools? How is education there? Are you happy with it or are you concerned? Uh, when, um, one, my, uh, one concern is uh, the language right. education. Um, my, I think uh, my biggest weak point is uh, speaking English. <laughs> so, um, this is, uh, and the Japanese uh, English education is some just to write and read. Right. Not, uh, Not to speak. Yeah. How to, uh, so, this is, uh, I think, one of critical points. Okay. But um, other um, curriculum is not so bad, I think. Okay. Mm, uh, um, like uh, the science or art or music is, uh, I think, really nice and uh, the um, interdisciplinary uh, environment is uh, hmm, really common. Excellent. So, Thank so you. This is when, when I thought that was what Suhail was getting at when he asked you about the primary system. 
Because what I've read is that in Japan, till the age of seven, the child is treated like a prince or princess, given complete freedom. They can do what they like, creatively, run around, go crazy, and they can never do anything wrong, they're never punished, etc. And then suddenly, bam, from age seven, it becomes a very regimented, very disciplined, very strict, no options, this is the way it's got to be a system. Mm. I, I'm just wondering if you feel you can comfortably explain to us why that happens, and, and, and surely a child that's enjoyed that much of freedom must struggle to suddenly be you know, confined within this very uh, the regimented system you described to us. Yeah, um, the, the, Easy most question. Of, the most of uh, school in Japan um, has uh, the completely divided uh, the elementary school and junior high school and high school and university. So we have to uh, make a, uh, have an examination and the, to enter the good uh, junior high school or high school university is really important thing so no, for, uh, to the, uh, the students. Uh, but that is, uh, I think, really bad point of the, uh, the Japanese education. And uh, my, my school was a completely uh, continuous uh, uh, school. So I never uh, had uh, examination to uh, junior high or high school and university. So I really uh, focused on my interests. Uh, and um, so that, that was, uh, I think, uh, that was a good e uh, uh, environment for me. But uh, most of the school uh, isn't like that. OK, great. Thank you. So before handing over to the audience, I'd like to ask one more question to each member of this panel. And if we can have a sort of a, a quick, quick, quickish answer. In your different capacities, and you all have very varied backgrounds. In, in, in your own way, you are all innovating, be it in, on the forefront of innovation or from your different perspectives. How do you recognize a good idea? How do you recognize a good idea? And I, it's open to whoever wants to start. I'll go. Go. I think uh, good ideas are very personalized. I think every single one of us sitting here would see a different good idea. And I think uh, the good idea that shines brightest for me isn't the same good idea that shines brightest for you. Absolutely. So I think it's about figuring out what shines brightest for you and following that thread. And that thread has got a constant synchronistic process of bringing good ideas to you. Fantastic. Love it. Anyone else? I think it's about the problem you're trying to solve. So it maybe goes back to, to what John is saying. If, if the problem is my personal problem and that solution solves that problem, then that's a good solution. But, but tell me the problem you're trying to solve, the why you're trying to do something before you tell me you know, what you're trying to do or, or you know, how you're trying to do it. You've, 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 you've seen a lot of people in the, on, in the entrepreneurial ecosystem here in Bahrain. How, how would you rate the problem-solving aspects or abilities of, this, of the startups you see in Bahrain? So it, it, it's funny. I went, to, um, oh, I went to Paris with a couple of our startups to um, a startup show there. The, the name of it escapes me. But it, it, it was funny, after walking around for, for a couple of hours with, with Abdullah and Mohammed, um, the, the guys got, they were really surprised at the depth, the, the kind of the deep tech that they were seeing in front of them. But what they weren't seeing was business solutions. So the what was there, but the why wasn't. And what I found was, uh, the guys, and, and I guess this is maybe an extension into maybe the entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial uh, uh, ecosystem that we've got here, the business acumen is quite good. Asking, how am I going to make a book out of this, comes very early. Uh, and then s s trying to, to, to solve, how am I going to do it, uh, is later. 
but but it, it is important to, to have that in mind whereas I would have seen the French ecosystem really really good tech but who's going to buy it who's your customer right. how are you going to get revenue from it so I would say maybe we're, we're strong on the business side but we have work to do on the tech side perfect thank you Dr. Tharo, how do you recognize a good idea? Well, I was actually, your, your question brought out the contrarian in me because I come from a country where good ideas are a dime a dozen. We get 10 of them a week. I mean, right. 10 of them a, a minute. You're right. What our problem is, is that for all the good ideas, we're hopeless at implementation. And so I was just saying, in fact, uh, one of our uh, big think tanks organized an ideas festival. And I said to them, we don't want an ideas festival, we want an implementation Absolutely. festival. Absolutely. There's no shortage of ideas in India. A good idea, I mean, I share everything the two of them said. It's, it's basically what you think strikes you as wow, and it'll work, and if it works and solves the problem, that's a good idea. But the thing is, making it work, getting it to deliver that solution. And as somebody in the real world of politics and public policy, I'm, you know, uh, I enjoy a good idea intellectually. But I'm really interested in the ones that people are going to deliver on the ground. Absolutely. And, and, I, and I say this always with my team. I, I actually, and I might sound really evil when I say this, I don't actually value creativity that much. You know, I mean, I do value it, but it's, it's relatively easy. You know, I was interv interviewed on an American podcast not too long ago, and I said the very same thing. You know, a child is creative. You know, I, 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 my 10-year-old is very, very creative but I wouldn't depend on them to implement. And, 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 and we see all this creativity and these creative houses and, and all that, but I'd like to see a real implementer and I'm still waiting to, de to, see, to, the, to see that superstar implementer. So I'll answer my own question before we go to Dr. Samar. Is for me, it's not the idea, it's the, the person presenting the idea I was supposed to build on what you were saying. Samar, your thoughts on a good idea? Yeah, I don't think there's much to add. I think good ideas are there are lots of ideas. Everybody has ideas. There could be uh, good ideas. Depends on your point of view. Hmm. It could be used for good or for bad. And so uh, it's important to see what's the purpose of that good idea. So it, it should, if it goes to help yourself, that's fine. But it could also help humanity. So that's a better idea. So there are different scales, I guess, different factors. You know, is it personal? Is it communal? Is it international? Um, that's one. The second is, you know, what do you do with that? Is there the discipline from, say, an entrepreneurship point of view, is there the discipline to turn an idea into a product or into an implementation? And that's key because there are lots of good ideas, but uh, they're just ideas, they're imagination. And so there must be a, uh, a question of what's the scale of that idea? How, how many lives will it affect? Impact, what will yeah. it do? Uh, from an ethics point of view, how good or bad is it? Um, you know, is it used for you know, military reasons? Is it used for humanitarian reasons? Um, and then you've got uh, the the team behind it. You know, what what would, what can you put behind it to turn it into into something real? And how fast can you deliver on that? And that's really important today: um, is to look at a good idea and see whether it can be implemented, whether it can be implemented quickly. It seems there is actually like a limited number of themes for good ideas. So sometimes you think of something and you see that like in the Nobel Prize, you know, three people would win it and they are three research teams that were working independently of each other hmm. on the same idea. And hmm. you see that often in science, um, in physics, chemistry, it's always like joint teams, somebody from the US, somebody from Japan or in medicine. So it's also how fast you can execute on that idea and bring it to ground. So it's important if you do have a good idea, work on it, be very disciplined, bring it to fruition very quickly and deploy it and, and then move on to the next great idea. So don't rest on that one idea. And I love it. it, I love it. So Kiyama san I think uh, the good idea um, should be um, <clears throat> well uh, oriented uh, mm -hmm. to the, the personal uh, motivation or uh, not only um, personal motivation or personal uh, the value uh, but also uh, oriented with uh, um, the social needs like global issues or mm -hmm. yeah I think mm, 
that so, is uh, so in, in a good idea in your view is is the impact it has on on society overall yeah 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 yeah, yeah. fantastic and i think uh mm, the the serious innovation must needs the serious personal uh motivation so fantastic mm. Thank you so much. I'd like to open the, the, the floor now to questions from the audience. If you can uh, make yourself known, please. We have a, someone raising their hand in the back enthusiastically. If we can have someone take the mic to them, please. If you raise your hand again, sir, so that they see you. Do we have, oh, I think we have all the mics here. So <laughs> you'll have to shout your question. Come to the front, sir, because it seems all the mics are here. Can we donate a mic, Dr. Sarul, can I, can I have your mic? And then we'll have, yeah, if we take it to the gentleman in the back. Welcome all. I am Thambi Nagarjuna. My main question is to Mr. Thadur and to the Japanese Swayang. Nowadays, the education is very costly. Previously, 5,000 years back, I think there is one Gurugula Sampradaya. Zero investment education started in India. And that was taken even by the Germans, followed. Even the Montessori, Kensu, and all started from the beginning is from India, I think. So where we lost, Mr. Tarur, our traditional zero investment education, which was the fantastic one, donated to the world. Second one to the Japanese, I think the Japanese education is based on Buddha thoughts. Based on what? Buddha, Sri Buddha. Okay. And he is telling the English is must. I am doubtful because so far without the English, the Japanese has conquered so much in the technology. And only 64 countries are using English. I'll need to Everybody is if, you can, if you can just summarize your question quickly, yeah. if, for, in the interest of time. So is it a must that English should be mandatory ah. for the, our Fantastic. growth? Clear. Thank you very much. Thank you. Come. Dr. Starur and then sikiyama -san. Well, you know, obviously the investment in education can always be greater. I've been advocating in every budget speech in Parliament that I've made that uh, they should be raising the percentage of GDP uh, that is expended on education. But still, Having said that, over these 70 years, there's been massive expansion. See, we forget the British left us with a literacy rate of 16%. Women in India, when the British left, were 8.8%. So there's a huge road to climb. So I, I agree with you objectively, we haven't invested enough. Uh, but what we've invested has taken us from that 16% uh, to, to more like 79 and 8.8% women to more like 69. So there's been a, a fair amount of progress. It's not good enough, and I don't disagree with you there. But I would, I would, I would challenge the proposition that investment alone will do it. There's all sorts of things. Uh, the quality of education, learning outcomes. There was a recent study that said that 53% um, of fifth graders could only read and add at a second grade level. Now, that kind of thing is hopeless. You may as well not waste your money educating them. Uh, if, if you're not actually teaching them skills that they should acquire in school. So that's really the, uh, the, fundamental, the fundamental challenge, I would say. Thank you. So, Kiyama-san, the question is, do, do you need to learn English? Is this important? Do students, should they be learning English or not? I believe that was the question. If we can pass a mic, yeah, I think you're all sharing one or two mics now. Yes? Yeah. Um, if uh, we can speak English very well, so that's... Uh, expand uh, the opportunity so to communicate with uh, other people. And uh, so I think that is really essential. Yeah, so, I would agree with that. To yes, thank you. May I just add something? Sure, sure. I, I think the whole question of language is going to go away. Uh, with uh, AI and faster communication speeds, I don't think it's any more important to have a universal or a common language because you can do an immediate translation mm. of languages. So I think this whole point, in my personal view, will disappear about 10 years down the line from now. Okay. And we so can, we'll see, we'll time you if, you if you're right. I, am, I have seen it substantially, like voice recognition has improved massively. Um, even translation programs compared to when I started using them 10 years ago to today, 
there is a vast improvement, and that's without the recent uh, improvement in computing power and cloud computing that's happening. So, you know, for us, it's always difficult to imagine what will the future be, but for sure, if you're looking at the field of AI, um, where and the fourth industrial revolution, where, as uh, John said earlier in his talk, it's uh, it's all about personalized approach. So uh, AI will actually not make you a number, but you'll be a, a, a very highly uh, customized, you'll find a highly customized solution for each individual. And I think that will include language, but that's just a Great. time will tell. Thank you. Next question, please. We have a question from the front here. It says one minute. I'm going to go over the time slightly. We have, can we bring the, on the first front row here, please? One question, sorry, because of time. So choose which one is your more urgent question. My question is for Dr. Jeshi. Uh, the question is, what does uh, an, an unreasonable thinker need uh, in order to translate his uh, thoughts into reasonable tangibles? And uh, what are the enablers? What are the ecosystems needed? Thank you. Great question. What does an un unreasonable thinker need to... I was apply? hoping someone will ask that question. <laughs> so. Uh, First of all, let's say, let's talk about, uh, uh, if you say an unreasonable, let's, if we define an unreasonable thinker in the context of innovation and disruption. Uh, first of all, you can't go and tell anyone to be an innovator. You can't just go to a group of people or to somebody and say, go and innovate. So innovation is one of those ephemeral things that just gets suddenly created. An idea gets into your mind, and it could be a great idea, and sometimes you forget it, and hopefully you don't, and, and you act on it. So what do you need for innovation and for like an unreasonable, an unreasonable thinker? What do you need to do is you must have the right nurturing environment. Now, where it, what we have in the past are like, in, we talked about schools. So schools tend to kill creative thinking because you're, you're supposed to memorize things. And in certain cases, I've even seen even today, uh, you're supposed to write your answers in a particular style. I was, trying, was working with my daughter about a week ago on something, and she says, Dad, if I, we have to write it this way. We can't write it any other way. And that was really, um, that's something like that would kill creativity. So you have to have the right nurturing environment. From an economic point of view, what you need then is to be able to deploy that idea very quickly and act on it. So you need two things. You need scale and you need finance. And so if you go to certain countries like in China, if somebody has a, a grand idea, even if it's a, you know, from a little town, the smallest town is probably around 80 million people. So, uh, so a <laughs> Only grand, 80 Bahrains. So already scale. Scale is so incredibly prevalent in China. That's why it's one of the richest landscapes for uh, a lot of uh, IT startups and, and, mm. and apps. The Chinese app market is spectacular. I think hundreds of times bigger than anything in Europe and the US um, because they find that scale very, very quickly. If you go in Silicon Valley, it's venture capital. So great ideas have access to two things, talent. So you need talent to take that idea and develop it and venture capital, which is available. What's really difficult here in Bahrain for us, I think I really admire entrepreneurs and uh, and uh, creative thinkers uh, who succeed because it's pretty tough. We have a very small population and finance has not in the past been made available. So here the people who succeed are through sheer will and perseverance. So you, I think in, in this context here, you need a lot of that. You need to be very stubborn and you need to follow up um, your ideas, don't give up. Uh, but uh, I think the EDB, uh, among several bodies, and Tabkeen are bodies that hopefully work to enable that nurturing environment. And I think they are. We have Startup Bahrain um, as an initiative, and a lot of other um, strategic programs are going. So I think politically here we have the will to move forward. And I, if I can just add to that, I think the exposure to unreasonable thinkers is important. And, and this is what this summit is all about, is bringing unreasonable people or unreasonable thinkers from around the world to expose people to them so that they think and start thinking about implementation. We're going to have a, an informal implementation panel tomorrow, inshallah. 
I'd like to thank my guests so much for, for their wisdom and insight, and we could sit here for hours and hours and just scratch the surface of, of, of the knowledge that we have at this panel. So Dr. Shashi Tharoor, Dr. Samar Jishi, uh, Kazuhide uh, Sikiyama-san, uh, John Sinai, John Kilmarskin, can we all give them a big, big hand for their uh, contribution today? Before, before you stand up, there is, there is, we want to take a group photo. The first group photo is a selfie with me, so stay where you are. We're going to all look at my phone here and try and fit ourselves into a selfie. Yeah, there we go. Thank you, and we can have a group photo with the photographers as well. Thank you. Please. Ah, Shlona, okay. You can see us all. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Look forward to it. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you.